I was really, really young. So it had to be between middle school and elementary, I guess. Tell the story. So, <laughs> so I remember this one time we had a, um, a culture day. This is when, you know, at, at my school, they, I guess they were trying to take on this whole thing of diversity. It really didn't work very well, but they, we had like this culture day. Basically, you, you were supposed to bring, you know, something of your culture. Now, I'm the only black kid in the class, and there's only, it's only one other black, there's only one other Hispanic kid. So, so it's me, I'm a black kid, and there's only one Hispanic in the class. So we're the only two minorities, and everybody else is white. So they were like, uh, you know, we're gonna have this culture day. And so we had this culture day, you were supposed to dress up in your culture, and like, so I dressed up in like this, you know, kind of like an African um, like leader or something like that. So I had on my tie, like a white tie, with like a white shirt and like a, you know, jacket. And, and, and I had like my sash or something like that that you wear, like, like the leaders wear. And so I remember um, one time we was like bringing food and everything and I was about to go eat the food and the teacher came up to me, white teacher. And she said, um, she says, Christian, um, I, I, I don't, I, I don't want to be rude, but I, I, do you, She's like, do you people eat this? I was like, wait. It's a new school year in most parts of the country, a good time to explore the important ideas being discussed and debated in education. We start our series with a report from Oakland, California, on a different approach to the dropout problem, where young black men are more likely to miss school, get suspended, or end up in jail. I think right now, uh, for black and brown boys, I would probably say we may be in a cold yellow or cold red. Six mentors are so important in the lives of our youth. Yes, as Milwaukee Public Schools sees it, when young people see examples of what they can become, they are more likely to take school much more seriously. I would say that it's, it's, the state is not too good right now. Organizers of the Black and Latino Male Achievement Program say that this will have a profound impact on our MPS students. Today's discussion was all about self-esteem and identity. The only kids that disrespect me is black kids. That's it. My own are the only ones that disrespect me. I walk in any other school, they like, they go ET. We taking notes. I come home, you talking. What happened to my brothers in the New York City public school system versus what happened to me was drastically different. I think we're in a state of emergency in the sense that our children need us, especially our brown and uh, black students. Many of our children are starting school and they do not know any English, so uh, they are held behind in this regard. All of the attendant problems that we see with black males are the same problems that we see with Hispanic males at language. So many of the issues that we see, I think there's a hyper invisibility with um, Hispanic males, there's a hyper visibility with Hispanic males. There's this notion that Hispanic males are locked into this notion of um, what identity should look like for them. This whole notion of machismo, you know, so black males, this whole notion of black masculinity, what that means. So yes, I think a lot of the attendant problems that we see with black male populations, we see the very same thing with Hispanic male populations. Uh, we know that if your school is a majority black and brown, you're significantly more likely to have a first year teacher. Uh, we know that you're significantly more likely to receive less funding per student. In some cases, it's as much as $1,500 to $2,000 per student. Both my parents, they never went to college. They realized if they had gotten like a degree or better like training and stuff, they could have landed in a better job where they have time for family and still have uh, money. It was just hard because since I moved schools a lot, multiple times, um, Moving from uh, a middle school that was kicking us out because it didn't meet the Texas like standards, and it was almost like remedial, to go into a really good school, it was hard kind of adapting to the difference in the actual like effort I had to put in and like what was expected of me. I went to a uh, predominantly black school, so it really felt as if our whole school was kind of left behind the district in a sense where. When you referred to Westlake, it was like you were referring to the ghetto school. We weren't ghetto, we weren't bad, we weren't those type of kids, but it always felt like we were the kids who had to work extra hard to prove that we could even be at the same level as a lot of the other schools in the area, which I guess was just kind of tiring. 
the students just have a lot of family problems um, and that ranges from uh, you know not having a place to live um, trying to arrange transportation for them to get to school sometimes they're hungry so they're still out of our lunch lines I had a student and um, during the school year at the beginning he was fine but around like October November um, his mom was incarcerated and therefore he became the man of the house. So, you know, him and his smaller siblings had to move in with grandma. Money was tight. Grandma wasn't used to supporting four children because he had three smaller siblings. And so I would see him, he would come to school lethargic, like barely able to keep his eyes open. A lot of them come from homes that are, um, sometimes in turmoil, I have a lot of things going on, a dysfunctional home, and they bring that to campus. Um, there is, you know, homelessness, there's some drug abuse things, and kids model what they see at home. So what happens at the family, um, they bring it to school, and so we, as a counselor, we have to help them to get above and around that. So uh, while I went to a decent school, down in Baltimore, D.C., there were a lot of uh really like unrepairable school districts, uh, metal detectors to get into the door sort of thing. And it's, the schools like that, they really never had much of a chance because they don't prepare their students really for anything. They're so underfunded, so understaffed, and the students are treated like criminals. So at the end of the day, the students still have to show up because of truancy laws, but they really don't do anything because at the end of the day, the school's so bad that it doesn't prepare them for the real world or college. We tell history, we tell why there is an opportunity gap. And so economics impacts what we're seeing on a day to day, mainly because we create meaning around that. And so yes, there's some real things there that go along with that, but listen, we're sending people all around the, you know, to the moon and back. If we want to fix these things, these areas, we can fix it. Stop sending the least prepared students, teachers to schools with black and brown kids that are low SES, uh, stop send, re, you know, reducing the funding, uh, send the experienced proven leaders, and so you, you address the wraparound services in a meaningful way. I can tell you over and over how many times I have seen some of our successful school districts that are upper middle, upper middle class, they don't have the teacher turnover, they don't have the uh, principal turnover. I've looked at urban schools where they've had to deal with four or five principals in a seven, eight year period. Can you imagine? That's just, it would never even fly at another school that had a different set of demographics. What does it mean to be black, male, and gifted in that actual education space, sitting in that P-12 classroom and sitting in that college classroom? You know, what does it mean to bring all of who you are, all those identities to bear on? Um, in that one particular space, you know. I would be interested in uh, receiving data that breaks down each category. So is it uh, boys, girls, African American, special ed? And that way, again, consistently trying to target the, uh, as closely as we can, the type of intervention is going to be as, uh, it's going to be more impactful. Uh, without breaking quiet, each, each child needs something different. Right. So. Uh, teachers don't walk in a room and say, oh, I have black and brown boys. Let me lower the standard for them. Uh, this is a part of the air that we breathe. It's been part of a systematic system. Um, and so we have to bring awareness that if you're not teaching every child like it's your own child, or the president's child, then you need to do more, you need to dig deeper. And so one of my models deals with how do we keep expectations high? I call it, the, it's referred to as the Pygmalion effect or self-fulfilling prophecy. In essence, students don't become what you think or they think, they become what they think you think they should become. And so a lot of times students are really rising to the level of expectations that teachers have set for them. What's up, man? You all right? Yeah, take your hood off. Uh, 
I'm very structured in my classroom. Uh, the reason that I am so hard on my kids is because I want to push them. And I tell them at the beginning of the school year, every set of kids that I get that I'm pushing you, I want, to, uh, I want you to see your full potential. Even if you don't feel like you have it, I want you to see it. And uh, oftentimes I'll show them their data at the beginning of the year and I'll show them their growth at the end of the year. And I'll say, look what you've accomplished. That's why I was hard on you. That's why I pushed you. That's why I stayed on you. I confronted you in the hallway when you, I knew you were supposed to be in the classroom. Building relationships with the kids. Uh, if the kid respect you, then you can get more out of them. If you say, hey, you know, chill out over there, be quiet, go ahead, handle your work, man. They're more likely to listen to you if you've built that relationship with them. And really, I would say, you know, in my my four year or five years teaching, like that's what I've been doing. Uh, my classroom is ran really strict, uh, but the kids, they, they actually want structure, especially if they respect you and get to know you and you have that relationship with them. One of the researchers, a scholar, uh, Dr. Gilman Whiting, he talks about the scholar identity model. And he says, basically, you're not going to get black and brown boys to be successful until they first view themselves and see themselves as being scholars. So what are we doing to foreground that? What are we doing to support that notion that these black boys can be scholars? Do they know it? Do we know it? So these are some of the things that we have to look at. So that whole notion, like you said, there is no one size fits all. It's extremely crucial that we make sure that education is important to them because not only could it be seen for them as a way out or a way to do better, but just the way to better the community, better themselves for their family in general. I think one, one way we can get, you know, uh, our young men, black and brown, and more involved in education as far as higher education through colleges is uh, the schools, I believe, we could do a better job at getting them engaged in college life. I think right now for a lot of our young men, going to college is not a reality for them. Uh, they can, some of them can only see as far as the, the neighborhood. And so to get them to engage, to, to actually walk on a campus, to see people who look like them, talk like them, dress like them, I think that would make it uh, more conducive for them to want to try to go to college. But I think a lot of them just seeing it maybe from a textbook or hearing it from a teacher saying it, but actually literally walking on the campus, I believe it takes a whole new meaning. And I think most of our, our students, black and brown, have never experienced walking or actually being engaged on a college campus. I have a very firm belief of seeing yourself. So I feel that if there were more black and brown male teachers or just men in general in the education realm that will be able to see, oh, Mr. Such and Such is a teacher. He's a black man just like me. He went to college. Maybe I can go to college too. We're still dealing with first generation college graduates, as you just shared. Uh, we still have a society that sees black and brown through a different lens. And so, um, an inferior lens. And so I don't, again, believe that teachers are walking in the door saying, let me just lower expectations for black and brown, or police officers are just, in general, are just saying, let me go shoot black and brown. But again, like the air that we breathe, we don't think about it. These, these ideas have been so ingrained, and it, were, it was a necessary part of, for us to, for slavery to work. So what I'm getting at is this. You have to address this on multiple levels. So of course it's an impact when you don't have uh, individuals coming back, but the reason they need to come back is because of that 400 year head start where black and brown individual, uh, as a people, we were not allowed to get a quality education. You can't be what you don't see. And I think one of the most powerful things is for you to go back and for those of us who come from those environments to go back and show them I'm a living, breathing model of this life that you can lead and even beyond. So they need to see those models. So I think by us doing what we're doing and going back into those communities and showing them, you know, I'm not a NFL person, I'm not NBA, you know, I'm a brother who came right here from this high school, right here from this elementary school, right here from this community but I was able to go on, get my degree, do these things, and um, be successful.